President Obama, I would like to ask you something. Where are the Syrians during all of this? What are they doing? And what do they think? It was an impossibly hot day in Rihani. I'm wandering the dusty streets, trying to find a house that will supposedly lead me to a children's center where I'm supposed to be teaching English to Syrian refugees, but everything seems a bit hazy. I'm sweating out of every pore of my body. The sun is seemingly burning holes through the skin on my hands and my feet. In the distance, I can see hills marking the border where Turkey meets Syria. Suddenly, I'm surrounded by a group of Syrian women who come running towards me, exclaiming in untranslatable Arabic and wrapping me in their arms and kissing me on my face, rendering me incapable of speaking or <laughs> even breathing. The Syrian revolution began in February 2011, when protesters in Damascus rose up and asked for greater civil rights. These protests spread to surrounding suburbs and communities. And then in March 2011, the famous massacre of Daa occurred, in which government forces openly fired on unarmed protesters. This sparked mass uprisings throughout the country, and soon people weren't simply calling for greater civil rights, but a downfall of the regime. This led to more government-led massacres, and then in June 2011, the Free Syrian Army formed to combat government forces. Syrians love talking about these first few months of revolution. A liberation of fear coupled with an electrifying sense of hope. Finally, they could live in a society not known for its infamous torture techniques and its internal police force, said to number one to every 154 Syrians. Rihani is a small, tiny Turkish border town about five kilometers from the Syrian border. Since the uprisings began in 2011, it has received an estimated 90,000 Syrian refugees. Every day, that number grows even larger. Walking through the streets, one finds wounded FSA fighters coming across the border to get treatment in hospitals, Turkish army trucks coming to and from the border, carrying 20 to 30 armed Turkish men, police trying to control a situation that is rapidly unraveling. Thousands of homeless Syrian refugees searching for shade beneath a single olive tree or one of the two mosques in the town. While many Syrians still call it al thoda meaning the revolution in Arabic, signifying a belief in a genuine political transformation, in my two months in Rihani, people began to call it something different. Al Harab, the war. A war marked by mass atrocities, loss, and misery. A war in which everyone, government forces, rebels, Turkish citizens, homeless refugees, everyone is suffering. But rather than spend the rest of my time today and talk to you about the ins and outs of the Syrian civil war, I'm going to talk about something different. Something not mentioned by President Obama in his speech, but something absolutely crucial if we are to speak about any international action in Syria. I'm going to talk about the people, the students, who led the first protests in their universities against the regime in Latakia, Bashar Assad's home city, and Aleppo. The women, who have lost their sons and husbands to terrible violence. Also, the laughter, the sleepovers, the incredible food, the ability and the willingness to love, the things that unite us as human beings. So after I was released from the women's grip, I met Reem, Ummi, and Ragda. Far from how you would picture a downtrodden Syrian refugee, Reem is a young Syrian in her mid-20s who is very particular about her appearance. She wears a full face of makeup every day, including the absolutely imperative bright blue eyeliner on the bottom lid. And if she's not wearing makeup, she wears dark sunglasses, even inside buildings, because she says, I'm not pretty today. One time we were taking photos in front of a waterfall, and as she's posing in her high heels, she falls backwards into the waterfall. It was quite funny. 
Ummi, her mother, is a 60-year-old woman from a rural province in Syria known as Idlib, which borders Rihani. Ummi can't read or write, knows no modern standard Arabic, and has never met an American in her life before me. Her only associations with America were what was translated to me as a luxurious life and the CIA, of which she is terrified. Umi became my mother away from home, scolding me when I wouldn't come over for meals and one time really laying into me, slapping me several times across the face when I didn't tell her that I was going away to the sea for a weekend. As loving as Umi was, she was equally as fiery, which if any of you know me personally, know that that is a characteristic that I also share. <laughs> She would make fun of my chacos, calling them ugly, and say, oh, yet? they're so heavy, you do them for sports, pretending to do bicep curls with them. <laughs> she would take chicken legs and literally shove them in my mouth with her bare hands, claiming that I wasn't eating enough, which I can assure you I was. <laughs> and then there's Ragda, a skinny, knock-kneed, nerdy, 19-year-old girl who is probably one of the bravest, most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. Ragda taught herself English by reading Charles Dickens and listening to hard American rock. She loves books probably more than she loves people. She writes poetry. She yearns for the sea. She believes in true and everlasting love. More than anyone else I met on my trip, Ragda connected our worlds in a way that no one else did. We screamed saying Taylor Swift's I knew you were trouble when you walked in. We debated about politics. Should the US intervene in Syria? What is the role of the US in the Middle East? And what is the role of women in a future Syria? We had sleepovers, where we stayed up until 3 AM talking and giggling about boys. When we were together, we no longer defined impossibly separate worlds, but rather worlds that were irrevocably connected. When we were together, we were young women, talking and giggling about things that young women talk and giggle about. It didn't matter where we came from. It mattered who we were, as young women, as thinkers, and as people. Why do you care about us? The women, along with many other Syrians, would ask me. And why do you study politics if you care about us? You're American. How many of us as Americans have ever actually considered what Syrians want done in their country? On September 10th, President Obama addresses the nation and inadvertently the world at large, listing the various U.S. strategic interests in the, in the region, the potential consequences of chemical weapons ending up in the wrong hands, the moral obligation we have as human beings, but did he once mention what Syrians want done in their country. And that is exactly the problem with the way we talk about humanitarian interventions. We omit the views of the very people we're supposedly acting morally on behalf of. Not only does this defeat the moral purpose of a humanitarian intervention, treating people not as strategic points on a map, but as human beings, it also renders the intervention much, much less likely to succeed. How can we expect the Syrians to support us if we omit their viewpoints from our public debates? Ragda wants a no-fly zone to protect civilians from government planes bombing overhead. Umi just wants Bashar dead. Well, I'm not advocating these as steadfast policies. Are their voices not as important as Americans, many of whom have never even been to Syria? So as long as humanitarian interventions continue to become increasingly common, as long as the U.S. holds its position of power in the international community, and as long as we continue to believe in the fundamental dignity of every human being, we must include the viewpoints of those we are supposedly helping because they matter. And it begins in the most militarized region in the world, a region in which the Tigris and Euphrates rivers cultivated a new existence for the human race. A region scarred by foreign policy debacles and misplaced fear, it begins in Syria. So first, we must begin by addressing the Syrian people directly. U.S. top officials like President Obama, Secretary of State John Kerry, and Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel must address the Syrian people directly to make them feel we aren't simply talking about them, 
but with them as well. Because I can assure you they're watching, and they feel used, and they feel ignored. One night I was watching TV with Ragda, and they were summarizing a speech by Obama, and she turns to me and says, oh, Obama talking about Syria again, and rolls her eyes. We must prove to them that we aren't just standing for vague moral values. We're standing for people. We're standing for them. Second, while these situations do prove adequate consultation difficult, we must work with existing humanitarian NGO networks to consult with the Syrian people directly. This means either including the NGOs in the public debate processes to represent the Syrian viewpoints, or it means using their networks to connect US top officials with Syrians directly, who then can incorporate these viewpoints in public debates, either within the US or in the UN Security Council. This doesn't mean US officials taking a weekend trip to a refugee camp and giving a few token speeches. It also doesn't mean searching for a consensus. Syrians are in a civil war, so likely there will be some disagreement. Rather, it means equally including the viewpoints of those we are supposedly helping. It means proving the existence of a well-running democracy, which incorporates the viewpoints of all affected parties. Third, our media, anti- and pro-war campaigns, and other activists must work to reframe their arguments from US-centric frameworks to global-centric ones. I've read few newspaper articles in major US publications talking about what Syrians want done in their country, rather what supposed experts, top officials, and other activists are saying about Syria. We must change our rhetoric from saying, we must save them from chemical weapons, to we must implement a no-fly zone, because that's what Syrians are asking for, and it is wrong to ignore their calls for help from humanity. This doesn't mean US interests aren't important. It just means Syrian interests are important as well. The other night, I was Skyping with Ragda, and she says to me, Bailey, we don't want American missile strikes. Please tell America this, because they don't hear us. But maybe, if US officials address the Syrians directly, if we use existing humanitarian NGO networks to incorporate the viewpoints of Syrians in our public debates, and if our media and other activists reframed their arguments around what Syrians are asking for, maybe Syrians like Ragda won't feel so frustratingly ignored. Syrians have a lot to say. They're not shy about sharing their opinions either. I mean, they didn't bow down in the face of government guns. All we have to do is ask. Thank you.